In this set of videos, we're going to talk about uh, pre-processing of uh, multivariate data in relation to chemometric modeling. Uh, it's not going to be a set of videos where we go through all the possible types of pre-processing, but we're going to select uh, some important ones, uh, some that are often used uh, in chemometrics. And we'll start with centering and scaling and go a little bit into detail with uh, what they do and why we use them. And then we continue uh, with normalization, uh, scatter correction, derivatives, baselining, and a little bit about uh, shift correction. And the reason that we want to do these things, well, it's basically to remove variation that is not interesting for us. So before we start any real modeling, could be a regression model or a PCA model, we'd like to get rid of irrelevant information or make sure that our data is represented in a way that is feasible for what we want. Often we're interested in removing specific items or specific artifacts in our data. For example, we may have a light scattering um, in near-infrared spectroscopy and we may be interested in getting rid of that in order to focus on the more chemical uh, part of the variation. Could also be that we have baselines that we want to remove for example in a chromatographic system. So there could be many different reasons why we want to remove artifacts from the data. At other times, we may be more interested in just representing our data more efficiently. For example, we may have non-linearities. Non we may prefer to use squares of our data. Or we may take uh, logarithms and things like that. We're not going to talk too much about that here uh, during these videos. But we will talk a little bit about shifts in your data. Now, normally when you model data, let's say according to Beer's law, you assume that the spectral shape remains the same uh, for the same chemical, no matter what the concentration is. But in some situations, the uh, peaks may actually shift, uh, and that's not feasible if we want to use classical bilinear models such as PCA and PLS, and we may want to uh, reduce uh, the influence of such shifts and we can do that with alignment uh, of different sorts. But let's start uh, by talking a little bit about centering. Um, so what is centering? Well in centering what we do is that we have our data matrix and in chemometrics that means different samples and the columns would be different variables. And what we do is that we calculate the average of each uh, variable. So in this case, the average of the first variable is 20 and the average of the second one is 30. And we simply subtract 20 from every element in the first column and 30 from every element in the second column. And in the end, then we will have the centered data. And what you will notice here is that the centered data in the sensor data, both variables are identical, so they will get the same influence on any model you would do subsequently, which is not the case on the raw data. On the raw data, the second variable has a higher uh, variation because it's further away from zero. And we actually intentionally want to remove that variation. We are not interested in the absolute variation. We are interested in the differences between the samples. So let me make an example. Let's say I have a set of measurements of uh, height measured in centimeters. If I average uh, this height, well, the average here would be 180. Uh, so my center data would be something like this. Now, what you also see here is that when you center the data, you change the meaning of the data. The original variable was the height and typically you will keep that la uh, label uh, in your plots later on but what you really have now is the difference in height not the actual height so for example if you do a pca and get a negative score value that doesn't mean you have a negative height it means that your height is below the average so you have to remember that when you do your interpretation 
And likewise, if you have a zero score, that means you are around average, not that you do not have any height, so to speak. So let me just get rid of this. So what is it we try to do uh, when we do centering? Well, basically, we're trying to remove offsets. Often when you think about a PCA model, you think about X being the product of scores and loadings. We call it a bilinear model. Uh, but that's actually not really what we normally have. What we're normally assuming is that we have indeed a bilinear part, uh, scores and loadings, but we also have an offset. So what we say is that our matrix can be described as scores times loading plus some kind of offset. And that means every sample will have the same, you can call it baseline or offset. That's what the vector of ones here indicate, that the vector O is present in each and every sample. And the way we try to remove that is by centering. Let me just show you what we do in centering. So the basis is that we have this and we would like to get rid of the offsets. And we do that by centering. And if we center the data here, for example, we take the mean of every column and we subtract that from the data. Now, that means that we can do PCA on the centered data, uh, like this. And we can take this part and move it on the other side to see that the PCA model of centered data, data is in reality a bilinear part, scores and loadings, plus the average. Which is not too different from what we have when we assume offsets. But note that these two are actually not the same thing. Uh, let me show you uh, in an example. Let me switch to MATLAB. Uh, and let me load a data set. Uh, okay, so I'm going to take a little spectral data set. This is a data set which is in PLS toolbox, but that's not really important here. So here we have a data set. Let me add an offset to this uh, data set. So I'm just going to add something like 0 0.8. So just a flat line to all of them. Uh, do that like this. Now you see, let me actually include, uh, let me include zero here. Ooh, I did something completely wrong here. Mm. Like this. So here you can see that we have a large offset here. Now, if I remove the actual offset, let me do that. We get the raw data back, that's fine. On the other hand, if I calculate the average of every column, so that means the average spectrum, that means I'm going to calculate the average spectrum and subtract it from each and every um, sample, each and every spectrum. Well, we can do that with the function called MNCN. You see, that's different. Now, every column, every column is centered around zero. So I also have negative values because the spectrum has now been replaced with the difference to the average spectrum. So centering is not the same as removing the offset, but it actually serves the function in, uh, I mean, it, it removes the offset in the sense that once you have centered your data, uh, also the offsets are gonna be gone. So by centering your data, you remove this, 
and some other stuff and that's the reason why um, we have to um, we don't actually get the baseline data we get something different but in any case we can model the data using scores and loadings after centering okay so why do we do that why do we censor the data well we do it in order to save uh, components actually if we didn't censor we would normally expect that we would need an extra component um, I mean if there was offsets in the data because it's it's important to note that if you look here on the offset how does that look well here's my bilinear components and then the offset is basically also a bilinear component it's just a funny one where the scores are all forced to be one so to speak so that's actually a bilinear component uh, a strange one in a way um, that's also why let's let's look at a one component model so if i have a one component model of a data set like this score one loading one and i compare that to a two component model like this now you sort of know that the two component model per definition will fit better than the one component model that should make sense but we could also do instead of a two component model I could do a one component model and then centering so this would be a vector of ones and this would be the mean I don't know if you can sort of conceptually see this but since this is a constrained version the offset it's not going to fit as well as a second component so in a sense it's in between so if you if you will you can understand centering as sort of a half component it's a bilinear component uh, and, and the good thing about understanding it uh, something like that is that you can more easily perhaps see when do you when would you actually like to censor and when would you not like to censor if it doesn't do anything if it doesn't remove any variation from your data then there's not really no gain in censoring let me give you an example let's say you have Beer's law data if i measure a spectrum of a uh, sample that has no analyte i'm going to get zero if i measure a spectrum that has concentration one i get this and two I get this this is data that follows Beer's law and zero signal means zero concentration there's no offset in this data set so in this particular case this would be a one component model and even if I censored the data it would still be a one component model so I would basically just be using more parameters to describe my data and that's what we would call overfitting there's no real benefit now in reality you don't really need, normally need to think much about this we kind of always do centering uh, just to make sure that we get rid of any potential offsets and the harm is almost always negligible so it's not a big issue but you could look into these things if you wanted uh, sort of more scientifically and evaluate whether you you really do need to censor the data Okay, enough about centering. Let's move on to scaling. Um, specifically, let's start with auto scaling. Now, PCA, as you know, is scale dependent. So if I have variables like here, I have the weight uh, measured in gram. Let me actually add another measurement here, which would be the weight measured in uh, kilogram, like this. So now I have two variables that both reflect the same information. But if I do PCA here, PCA is only going to see this one because it's a thousand times bigger than the other weight. So it's going to say that uh, the gram weight is much more important than the kilogram weight. And clearly that's not uh, correct or reasonable. And, and this is exactly where we would normally want to do uh, auto scaling for example so in auto scaling we simply divide each variable by its standard deviation and that means every variable has the same size 
that means that every variable has the same chance of entering uh, the model. This is the default scaling that you would apply unless you know something specific uh, about your data. Uh, for example, let's say we're doing uh, spectral data again. Very simple spectral data. Now the fact that the signal is zero on in at this particular wavelength means that there's less information than here where the signal is much higher. So the size of the signal between variables makes a difference. If you look down here, the size of this compared to the size of this had no significance. There's no in, um, information in one being larger than the other. It's only the variation within this and within this that matters. And that's why we auto scale to get rid of that information. But in spectroscopy and sort of in most kind of smooth curves could also be a time series, you would be a little bit more reluctant with doing um, scaling. Let me show you an example. Let's uh, take the same data set as we looked at before. So let me just clear everything here and load the beer data. And I'm going to open up uh, my analysis window where I can load the data in because then we have a nice little interface uh, to see what the scaling does. So I'm going to load my spectral data. Just before we only looked at part of it, now I want to see the whole spectral data set. And that's what we have here. So this is a spectral data set. These are UVVIS NIR uh, spectral data of uh, beer samples. Uh, that's not really important here. Now normally you would do centering on data like this. And in fact in PLS toolbox the default pre-processing methods are exactly mean centering, auto scaling or no pre-processing. But I'm going to go into the more advanced pre-processing uh, tool uh, to get access to a little bit more features. And one of them is that I can show the data. Uh, so let me see here. So this is the raw data. Let me uh, mean censor the data. You can see that we have a lot of pre-processing methods. We're going to talk about that later on. For now, we only worry about uh, mean censoring and scaling. If I mean censor the data, they look like this. Now, if you know a little bit about spectroscopy, you can see that things are not so fine here. There's a lot of noise in the data. Uh, and I don't know if you can imagine what will happen if I auto scale these data. Let's try and do that. So now I auto scale. And remember that auto scaling means both centering and scaling. So I really don't need this one. It's not harmful, but I can remove it because auto scaling is both centering and scaling. Now each variable has the same standard deviation now. And you can see that the problem with that is that it's going to blow up the noise enormously. And that's the bad thing with uh, auto scaling. It doesn't actually worry about the information content. So. Auto scaling is usually not our preferred tool when we have spectral data. Instead, we prefer to do mean censoring. And you can sort of see that it makes more sense here. It doesn't blow up the noise as much as, uh, as the auto scaling. Now, there are ways to change the settings of auto scaling. Um, if you look here, you have access to settings. Instead of dividing by the standard deviation, I can do uh, different little tricks uh, to sort of tweak the behavior. So for example, I could have a scaling threshold. So if the standard deviation is very small, I'm not going to divide with it. Because if I have noisy variables, the standard deviation is going to be small, so I divide by a small number, and that's going to uh, scale down 
uh, or sort of explode, sorry, uh, the uh, variable compared to the other ones. So if I add a threshold, now what's a reasonable threshold here? Well, we're measuring absorbances and they go from zero to quite high, actually four or something. Um, I don't know, 0.1 absorbance? Let's see. That makes a difference. Now you can see that compared to just mean centering, we did get, oh, sorry. We get this part scaled compared to this one without blowing up this part. Now I selected a random threshold. Well, not really random, right? I have an idea about what noise is because I n know from my chemistry, I can sort of evaluate how big the variation is in the noisy area. But I would probably want to play around a little bit with these numbers to see uh, what would be a nice uh, threshold. Oh, yeah, threshold for the uh, scaling. But you see, you can actually play a little bit around with the auto scaling if you want. But normally, we would definitely just say no scaling here, but mean centering like this. Okay, I'm going to close this and go back here. So that was scaling. And we already talked a little bit about these uh, different uh, settings that we have and that you can uh, play around with them yourself. I'm not going to uh, go into that here now. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some other types of um, uh, pre-processing uh, scaling uh, of different types of data. Uh, we have two kinds of pre-processing that I used in a number of occasions where auto-scaling is not useful um, and where no scaling is not useful. And the scenario is typically something like, well, basically what you see here, uh, this could be chromatographic data, illusion profiles. You can have very big peaks and you can have very small peaks. And it may well be that the information here is more important than the information here. So how do you scale your data to take that into account? If you do auto scaling, you're going to blow up the noise. And if you do no scaling, you're going to attach more importance to the big peaks than to the small peaks. Well, it turns out that these Pareto and Poisson scaling are actually uh, very useful uh, for that. The Poisson scaling is related to count data and is often used, for example, in mass spectroscopy or in um, uh, Raman spectroscopy uh, as a scaling method. Uh, but let's take a look at a data set. Uh, this data set is not in PLS toolbox, but uh, I'll show you uh, how it looks. It's uh, chromatographic data. Let me get rid of these data. I'm going to clear and say load. Okay, so it's a data set of 150 samples and 7,000 variables. Now let me load it in here. Let's take a look. Okay, so this is a chromatographic data set. And you can see we have some very big peaks, but we also have some very small peaks. And we would like to look at all of these, basically. So let's see what we can do. Let me go into the advanced pre-processing. And I'm not going to do auto scale. Well, maybe I will try that. Let's, uh, let's take a look. Let's uh, try and do auto scaling. So I'm going to go down here and select auto scaling. I'm assuming that that will look fairly terrible. Let's zoom in. It's a little bit difficult to see anything here. Uh, let's see. Let's go th uh, from... So here we have three peaks, more or less. One, two, three. Now you see that when I auto scale the data, they kind of disappear. Uh, not completely, but the noise is much bigger than the peaks now. Okay, let, 
Let me just split up the auto scaling because as, as we talked about, auto scaling is both scaling and mean centering. We can actually do them separately. Let me zoom out again. This is the scaling part. I just want to show you what happens when we scale only. Uh, we were looking at these ones. Okay. Now, now I have scaled. That means the spread of every variable is constant. And once I center the data, I'm going to subtract the average profile. So let me do the mean centering. Whoops. Where was the mean centering? Here. Here we are. So now, oops, zoom out again. Uh, oops. And there we are. So now I mean centered and scale. So I did auto scaling in a two step approach. Okay, now let's have a look at some of the alternatives. Uh, here. So one of them would be the Poisson scaling, which is basically scaling by the square root of the mean. So let me show you here. So instead of scaling by the standard deviation, if I am scaling here, I'm going to scale, I'm going to take the mean value and then I'm going to uh, scale by the square root of that. That also means specifically don't do mean censoring before, uh, because then the mean is zero. Okay, let's see. Let me zoom out and let me zoom in on our little region. Here we are. Okay, we have to zoom in here as well. Uh, okay. Oops. Okay. It seems like we did better. You see, this one is not as big compared to this one as it was before. The difference is not uh, huge, but uh, we seem to be doing a little bit better. We are scaling, we are leveling the peaks without blowing up the noise. Let's try the other alternative here, which is Pareto where we, it's kind of half auto scaling. Instead of scaling by the um, uh, standard deviation, we scale by the square root of the standard deviation. And let's see uh, how that looks. Uh, this region. And this region. Okay. The negative, that uh, makes no difference, is just the scaling. Um, looks interesting. Let's add the centering now and see how it looks. And we probably have to scale it. Scale out, zoom out, zoom in. Uh, here. Okay, you see, well, I don't know how clear it is, but, but these are much more similar level now. Uh, actually, all three uh, peak areas than they are in the raw data. And we haven't blown up the noise so much. Now, what? well, in certain areas, uh, this is used uh, kind of in a default way. But very often, people will actually just go in and look and try different uh, types of pre-processing and either see visually which one does a nice job, or you can also, let's say you're building a regression model, see which one will predict better. Uh, that all depends uh, uh, on what your purpose is um, and also which uh, type of data uh, is being used. Uh, right. Okay. So that was Pareto and uh, Poisson uh, scaling. They also used uh, quite a lot, for example, in metabonomic uh, data analysis. One final thing uh, that I would uh, like to talk about is um, when we have 
different blocks of data. Imagine that you have, uh, well, here's an example where we have spectral data and a concentration. Well, just imagine here, let's say you have some spectral data and let's say the variance, the total variance of this is a million because you have a lot of samples and a lot of wavelengths. And now I'm going to add one single extra measurement and that particular measurement uh, has a small variance. So maybe a concentration and it has a variance of one. Well, if you add that next to a huge data set, the thing is, whatever model you're going to build is never going to see this one. Imagine that you want to have equal focus on these two. That's not going to happen if you just put them next to each other and do a PCA on the combined data. If you want to have equal focus on both of them, basically you have to multiply, let's call them x1 and x2. You should multiply x1 with the variance of x1. And you should multiply x2 with the variance of x2. Slightly uh, sloppy uh, notation here. Uh, but the thing is, if you do that, then each of the two blocks will have the same variance, but they're going to have, uh, uh, I mean, disregarding uh, the size of the, them originally. And let me just show you that we have that option too. It's called group scaling. I'm not going to explain it in detail here, um, but basically you have to have a measure of what group a, sam a variable belongs to and then you can make sure that each group no matter if you have two groups or nine groups or whatever have the same variance so that all of them uh, can take part of the modeling and with that i think we're done with the scaling and censoring